Okay, so this 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 week we're going to discuss the con the relationship between the employee and the employer. One aspect of it, at least, the aspect of if there's a dispute about whether or not the employee was paid, and it comes in continuation to what we discussed last week that there's a very uh, the Torah ascribes uh, great importance to the mitzvah of paying the employee on time, to the, to the extent that although there is uh, one. The verse says you have to pay on time. It's written both in the positive form and the negative form. Pay on time, do not delay. So it's both a positive mitzvah and a negative mitzvah. And in addition to that, um, the Talmud, the sages say that if a person does delay the payment on time, he is actually violate, violating not two but five commandments because it's all, all any commandment that discusses withholding money that belongs to somebody else, it would be violated by withholding the payment or even just delaying the payment. So that was the discussion last week. Now we're gonna discuss the question of what happens if you have this um, if you have this dispute and a question regarding whether or not the employee was paid. So like I said last week, today you can check it up. You could check the bank statements and you could check the electronic records. So it's much easier to figure out if the person was paid. But back in the day, it's a question of whose memory to rely on. And that is the, that's the approach. Now, what we're going to have over here, we're going to get to Maimonides, which puts it straightforward. But before we read the Maimonides, we're going to read it in the Talmud, which keeps jumping back and forth, because there's two ways, at least there's multiple ways to look at this, and we keep jumping back and forth. Ultimately, we reached a conclusion, uh, which Maimonides codifies. When you read Maimonides, Maimonides, you don't realize that it took the Talmud a half a page to get to that conclusion. Okay, so let's start with from the beginning. What do you do in a, st a standard classic case where it's my word against your word? I say you owe me money, you say you don't. Standard case. So the standard case is simple. The standard case is that <clears throat> you don't have to pay. In other words, uh, in English, they say uh, possession is, is nine tenths of the law. In Hebrew, you say, <laughs> if I want to extract money from you, the burden of proof is upon the person who wants to extract. So if I come to you and I say, uh, you owe me $50, if I don't have any proof, if I don't have a document, if I don't have witnesses, then I cannot, the court will not make you pay. I cannot make you pay because uh, the burden of proof is upon the person who wants to extract money. That's the standard, that's the beginning point. Okay, it happens to be that the sages instituted an oath. What happens if I come to you and I say, Yankel, you owe me money. And you say, I don't. So the court and the court is going to, is going to, um, the court is going to, is, can't do anything for me. Uh, but the court feels bad for me. I hate to say this word feels bad, but they feel bad. So what are they going to do? They say, you know what? Even though the plaintiff cannot extract any money, but the defendant has to take an oath. Now, it's not a biblical oath. The biblical oath is a serious matter. A biblical oath when the Torah says, actually in this week's parsha, there are the cases where the Torah says a person has to take an oath. A biblical oath is a serious matter. First of all, you have to hold a Torah scroll or another holy article. You also have to say God's name. So that is serious business. Then there's an oath that is an oath instituted by the sages. It's called Shuat Heset. It's not clear what the word Heset means, but it's just an oath. It's a, I take an oath that I don't owe you money. It's much less severe. We do it to make the guy feel good. Who's the guy? The plaintiff, the guy who's kept demanding money, but he has no proof. But again, that is just something the sages add, which doesn't really change the bound, the, the underlying, the underlying, um, 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 the underlying base from the premise, which is consistent with the rule, is that if I want to extract money from you, the burden of proof is upon me. So that is the standard case. There are exceptions that the rabbis institute. So there are exceptions that the rabbis say, even though that's the standard. We're going to change that. And the Mishnah in Tractate Shavuot, which is the tractate that deals with oaths, discusses those some of those um, 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 some of those exceptions. And in the exceptions, what happens is the person who wants to extract money, even though he does not have any, um, even though he doesn't have any proof, he would be able to extract money, and, but he has to take an oath. In other words, typically the oath is for the defendant. In other words, the defendant takes an oath and he doesn't have to pay. But here there's an oath where the person who wants to extract money would, uh, would take an oath and extract money in these few exceptions. What are these exceptions? 
So the exception that we're most interested in is I am, I am an employee. I'm your employee. I come to you and I say, um, please pay me. You say you already paid me. So the, the, the Talmud is going to say in that case, why that is, we'll get to that. will take us a half a page to establish. But if I'm employee, we know that I'm employee. So we know that we already have a relationship. It's not just somebody, I'm a, someone off the street, but I'm your employee. And I come to you and I say, you owe me money and you didn't pay me and you claim you did pay me. Usually the standard would be that the employer does not have to pay because the employee has no proof that he wasn't paid. Um, usually, maybe the sages would say that the employer would, doesn't have to pay, but should take an oath, okay? Here we say, instead of the employee taking an oath and, 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 uh, and not having to pay, we're gonna flip the oath. We're gonna say the, I'm sorry, I'm getting confused. Instead of the employer, I'm, I'm, I'm just wanna make sure I said this right. Let's go back. Usually the standard would be that the employer does not have to pay. And maybe the sages would say that the employer should take an oath that he had not paid, okay? But here we're gonna flip it. We're gonna say that the employee takes an oath that he was not paid and he gets paid. Why that is, that's what we're gonna discuss. But before we go there, we just wanna make sure that uh, we're clear if I haven't said it, if I, if I have not confused you, otherwise we continue. Okay, and you see here that, again, this is not biblical. It's just the sages thinking about what's the right way to run the economy. And you're going to see that there's different concerns. We want to, we want to do good to everybody. We have to, you see what it's, what, what the sages are trying to do here. And some of these, uh, some of the, some of, some of these concerns are valid, but then the question is, how do you balance these, these varying concerns? So before we get to Maimonides, we're going to go straight to the Talmud and I'm going to share the screen. Uh, tractate Shavuot, chapter, um, page 45a. Here we go. I think this worked? Yes, okay. Rather, Rav Nachman says, that Samuel says, permanent ordinances were taught here. Okay, before in the Talmud, Tal Tal it's a discussion how to, how to classify this law. First, they said it's a law, meaning implied that it was given out from Moses at Sinai. Then we say, no, it was not the law. It wasn't given from Sinai. It's not a halacha, it's a takana, an ordinance. An ordinance means it's completely rabbinic. What happens here? The sages uprooted, uprooted the oath from the employer and imposed it upon the hired worker due to the fact that his wages are his livelihood, right? We read the verse last week. Last week, the verse said that pay the guy on time because his soul is waiting for this payment. He really needs the money. So Rabbi Nachman says, because the employee really needs the money, therefore let the employee take an oath and extract money from the employer, even though he has no proof that he was not paid. So Thomas says, one second, this guy needs the money. So just because you need the money, that's why that's why uh, all, 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 laws of, of, uh, all laws of evidence are out the window. That's why you could take money away from somebody else just because the employ employee needs money, just because the worker needs money. The Gemara asks, due to the, need, due, due to the need to protect the hired worker's livelihood, do we penalize the employer by leaving him vulnerable to dishonest worker? So of course the employee, of course the worker needs money. But because the worker needs money, that's why you're, gonna, you're, go, you're going to penalize the owner who has to pay even though he, he, there's no proof that he has not paid. And usually, again, this is contrary to the, com, to the usual law, which would be that if somebody wants to extract money, the burden of proof isn't upon the person who wants to extract, meaning the burden of proof is upon the worker. Over here, why would you say that? It was, so just because the worker needs the money, that's why you want to penalize the employer? That doesn't seem fair. So the Gemara says, well, it's actually funny how we go back and forth. The Gemara answers, the employer himself is amenable to the hired worker taking an oath and collecting his wages so that the laborers will accept employment from him. If the workers are not protected in this manner, they will, wary of, they'll be, they will be weary of accepting work. So here the Talmud puts forth, puts forth an argument. We'll see in, in a second the counter argument, but the argument goes like this. The employers want the, employ want the workers to be happy. Why not? Because if the workers are not happy, then the workers are not gonna, gonna, are not gonna accept employment. So if you don't pay the worker when he claims he has not been paid next time, nobody's gonna wanna work for you. So therefore we believe the worker because the employer wants, uh, the employer benefits from believing the worker. 
So the Gemara says the other side, what are you talking about? It's a, it's, you could look at it both ways. You could look at it the other way. You could look at it that you bet that the, that the worker should be happy to believe the owner because if the owner is not happy, if the employer is not happy, then the employer will not hire the worker. In other words, why would you say that, that they, they both here, they both have a benefit to believe the other one. So why are you looking just at the fact and saying that the, that the employer needs employees? Yeah, but the workers also need employers. So uh, you, can't, um, you can't discriminate against, against the employers just because the employer needs, needs workers because you could flip the argument and say that you should actually protect the employer and their workers would be happy because the workers need to be employed. So that's what the Gemara says. The Gemara continues. The Gemara asks, on the contrary, isn't it preferable for the hired worker that in the case of a dispute between them, the employer takes the oath and is released from payment? He would agree to his, this arrangement in order to create conditions in which the employer will, will readily hire him. If employers are exposed to the risk of being cheated by dishonest workers, they will be wa wary of hiring. The same idea. So that's so now we're stuck. In other words, now we don't now we don't know why the sages did it. In other words, we're sort of we're sort of at we're sort of at a, at a place where we're even now. We can't figure out why believe the worker at the expense of the employer, even though usually the standard law would be that you believe the employer because it's the it's the worker who wants to extract money from the from the employer. So we tried different things. We tried to say, well, this guy needs the money. The worker needs the money. Let's believe the worker. We say, no, it doesn't work because just because the worker needs the money, that's why the, the employer should lose. So we try to say, well, the employer is happy that the worker is, should be believed because otherwise no one would want to be a worker. So one second, we could flip it around and say that the worker should be happy. We should believe the owner. Otherwise, no one's going to, um, um, we should believe the employer. Otherwise, no one's going to want to employ, wor employ workers. So right now, we, are, we know it. We, we, we don't really yet have a reason why we should um, believe the worker even though the worker has no, even though the worker has no, has no evidence on his side. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed a step. I, I didn't miss a step. We, we, we still, we're still going to try one more on this way. This idea of saying that um, we're going to go one more step. Share. Um, the Gemara answers the employer perforce hires, hi, hires workers since he needs the, the work done. In other words, the employer has no choice. The employer is always gonna have to hire, hire workers. So the employer has no choice but to hire workers. So therefore, it's actually helped to the employer to believe the, the worker so workers will wanna be hired. The Gemara asks, doesn't a hired worker also perforce accept, perforce accept employment since he needs it for his livelihood? So it's very interesting. Who is more in the need in this relationship? The Gemara tries to say, well, the, the employer, is, he's got the assets, but if you have a field, you're not going to do anything with the field if you can't plow the field and you need people to work for you. So uh, you have management and you have uh, labor and who needs more, who's forced to hire who? So here we start by saying, well, maybe the employer uh, is forced to hire workers, so he has no choice. Now, or now we just want to make conditions that the workers will want to get hired and we do that by ensuring that if they claim they weren't paid, that they will be paid. But the Gemara says, on the other hand, no, who says that? Just like, the, just like the, the, the employer is forced, the worker is also forced because the worker also needs money. Rather, so now here we have the answer. What's the answer? And this is what the Talmud is, this is what Maimonides is going to quote. And later, we, but later we're going to finish the discussion. But this, this is the conclusion. And that's why Maimonides just quotes, quotes the conclusion. The answer is rather, the reason the worker takes an oath is that the employer is distracted with managing his laborers so it is reasonable to assume that he forgot to pay. What is the Talmud saying? The Talmud is saying, let's assume that here that nobody is evil. Let's assume that both the employer and the worker are decent people. Nobody has an intention to lie. That's the assumption. Why would we assume otherwise? Now we have a problem. The employee says, the worker says, I have not been paid. And the owner says, I paid you. Okay, so what are we going to do? We could sit and figure out who lied. Let's assume nobody lied. Let's assume it's an honest mistake. Who is more likely to make the honest mistake? So we say like this, the employer is busy. He's running an enterprise. He has many employees. He has to hire supplies. He's got a whole business to manage. 
He has so many other things to distract him. The worker, he just has a simple job and all he's thinking about from morning to night is when am I getting, getting my paycheck? So it's not likely to believe that he got his paycheck and he forgot, right? If somebody wants to be dishonest, it's a different story. But we want to assume, we want to assume that both parties are honest people and both parties um, made an honest, and somebody here made an honest mistake. But we have in this condition, usually, like I said, usually it's an exception to the rule. Usually if there's a dispute, if I think you owe me money, the burden of proof is upon me. If I have no proof, I can't get any money from you. But this would be the exception. I am your employee. You agree that I'm your employee. We'll talk about that later if you disagree. But I'm your employee. You acknowledge that I'm your employee. I'm your employee. I work for you. We all agree about that. The question is, did I get paid or not? You said you paid me. I said I had not get, gotten paid yet. So let's assume, so the Talmud says the conclusion right now is let's assume both are trustworthy. Somebody made a mistake. Who made a mistake? The one who's more distracted with his multiple employees. And I'm adding he has other multiple responsibilities. He's got to worry about paying back the bank. He's got to worry about supplies. He's got to worry about the markets. He's got a lot of things to worry about. So he so he so he thought I pay. He thought he paid his employee. Whereas the employee, if he's honest, and assuming let's say we take out the the, the question of maybe he's being dishonest because we don't know, but let's assume he's honest. Then it's much more likely. It's much less likely that he that he doesn't re remember that he got paid because he he. He's working to get paid, and this is important to him. It's the only thing he basically has to worry about. So that is the first section, and we're going to get to it. Now, now the Talmud continues about the oath. Why did, we, why did they make him take an oath? So we're going to go back and forth about the oath. But that is uh, the, first, the, first, the, first, uh, the first chunk, the first piece. So if anybody wants to comment, uh, you agree, you disagree, um, please do. Or share some insight or jokes. Otherwise, we continue. Okay, we continue in the journey and then we're gonna read it inside, inside, inside Maimonides and we'll get to we'll maybe branch out to other subjects. Oh, whoops, I'm looking at Maimonides, we should look at the Talmud. So the Gemara says like this, the Gemara raises a difficulty, but if it is presumed that the employer forgot to pay, let him give the wages to the worker without the worker taking an oath, right? What did we say? We say that the worker, because, I, because the worker does not have any evidence the worker has to take an oath. I take an oath that I have not got paid, gotten paid, and the employer pays the worker. But if you just gave me a reason to say that we assume that it, the employer made the mistake and the worker did not, because the worker would not have forgotten something so critical for the worker that whether or not he got paid, if that's the case, if you if you have a reason to believe him, so why does he have to take an oath? Believe him without an oath. That's the next step in the Talmud. So, so if you presume that right, the employer forgot to pay, let him, give him, let, him give, let him give him the pain without an oath. So the Gemara explains, the oath was instituted to alleviate the concerns of the employer, to ensure him that he is not being cheated. In other words, yes, we really don't need an oath. We really trust, we really trust the worker that he was not paid. We think the employer made a mistake. So why do we impose an oath on the worker to make the employer feel good? So the Talmud continues, and why did the sages not institute that the employer should give the worker his wages in the presence of witnesses so that it could readily be established whether he was paid? In other words, why don't we make a system instead of saying you'll always believe the, 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 the worker, you should always say that you have a responsibility. If you're going to pay your, your employee, you have a responsibility to pay them in front of witnesses or in simple English, in our case, you could say, or without a lawyer or make a contract. Okay, contract is hard. You have to write a contract. You have to know how to write a contract. So simply say, don't pay your employee. You should say that you have to pay your employee in the presence of a of witnesses, and that's it. And that's how we protect everybody. And if you didn't, if the if the if there was no witnesses, and the and the employee claims he was he, I'm sorry, and 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 the employer claims he he paid, then we would say we are your witnesses. So if we're so concerned that the owner is going to forget. Instead of putting an oath on the employee, why don't we just say that the owner should only pay in the presence of witnesses? And if he hasn't, if he didn't pay with witnesses, the employee should get paid without taking an oath. So the Talmud says, what we keep saying here is that it's not so simple, it's a burden. So, um, so the Talmud answers, the Gemara answers, finding witnesses whether he, whenever he pays wages 
will be a burdensome matter for him. So in other words, you can't do this. You have to allow for, for commerce to, to flow. You have to be able to allow people to pay without having the burden of finding witnesses. Remember, witnesses have to be kosher witnesses. I can't be your cousin. I can't be related to you. Right? Living in a shtetl, I'm related to you because from, from four different ways. Uh, go find people. You know, how many times I come to a wedding in, in Brooklyn, you go to a wedding and in the morning, who comes to the wedding early is just the relatives. So before, before, the, uh, before the actual wedding, when it starts filling up, the rabbi has to write the ketubah. It's not always easy to find two witnesses to sign the ketubah who are not related, right? Related to one party or the other, right? Go find two people who came early to the wedding, who comes early to the wedding, people who are friends, relatives. So, so it's not so easy to find, you know, kosher witnesses. So we have to allow for commerce to flow. I, I can't pay you because I don't have two witnesses. It's, it's, it's not going to, we can't impose that obligation. So now we say one second, and why did the sages not institute that the employer should give him his wages at the outset when he hires him? So there will be no need for an oath. The Gemara answers, they both want the work to be done on credit. In other words, they both benefit from credit, i.e. before the wages are paid, as sometimes the employer has no money ready when he hires a worker, and the worker also prefers receiving his money at the end of the day. So it doesn't say why, but I believe um, that the reason would be that if I get paid in the morning, now I have to worry about my cash, I have to guard my cash the entire day in the field. If I have not got paid, gotten paid till later, then I am then I am then, then you're prote- then the employer is protecting it, and then I'm happier. So both would both like the institution of both like the idea that the, you can work on credit and get paid at the end of the day. So that's why the sages are not going to impose an obligation. In other words, the question is like this: to impose an oath is sort of a uh, to impose an oath is something you only do at, at a last resort because we don't want people taking oaths if they don't have to. So the question would become, why don't you uh, do something else, create some other system that would, av- that would avoid the need for an oath? So what would the possibilities be? Number one is you must pay in the presence of witnesses. And if you don't, and, then, and, and the employer claims he paid, we don't believe him, and the, and the worker would be able to get the money without, without, the, without, the, uh, without, without taking an oath. Talmud says, no, it's too burdensome to, to, to get somebody to have to go and find witnesses. The other option would be to pay in the beginning. Well, they both would rather not pay in the beginning. I could add some other reasons. You pay in the beginning, maybe the guy will leave in the middle of the day. There's other issues, but we'll get to that later because there are other issues about what happens if you break the contract and you leave in the middle of the day. That's its own discussion. Okay, so that's the first section and uh, uh, we'll take the questions. We'll read it in Maimonides and then we'll see if we want to expand further. Go ahead, Vicky. Well, I have workers making noise. I'm not sure if you can hear me, but uh, you pay them. Uh, that. You pay them. Get witnesses. <laughs> I, I live in the condo, but I, I have a, I have a question. What about the receipts? Why why can't employer take a re, uh, employee take a receipt? Uh, employer take a receipt that he paid. Yeah, you bet. You want you want a contract. You want a valid contract that should stand. Not, up not in a contract, it's just a receipt. I would, I would say that to have a proper receipt, that has to be a contract, and to have a contract is a burden. That would be my guess. That would be my guess because it seems from the Talmud that it's easier to find two witnesses than make a, than, than, than than write a receipt. A receipt is a contract. Okay. We have a lawyer. We have lawyers on the phone. You, I, all I want to do is write something. I just want to make a contract. Meanwhile, the lawyers send me. 30 pages. I just want to open up an email, Google account, and there's how many hundreds of pages of contracts. Once the lawyers start with contracts, you'll never finish. So it seems that it seems that the Talmud assumes that finding two witnesses is actually easier than drawing up a contract. Contract is a receipt. Doesn't you don't need contract is essentially a receipt. But it seems like finding two witnesses would be easier. And even that we say it's not fear, the burden of the economy, the burden of the employer to have to go find witnesses. And think about it, it's also a, bo- a burden for the employee because what happens if the employer couldn't find two witnesses? So now the sun sets, now I have to go home. I wasn't get paid and we will delay it to tomorrow. And we'll see later in the Talmud, never delay it to tomorrow. We'll see later that the right of the worker to claim that he has not paid, he's believed that at, at the time when the payment is due. If he comes back tomorrow or the next day, uh, then his, 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 his uh, claim is, we don't necessarily take, take his word if it's after the time he was supposed to be paid. So we have to get paid as soon as the time is due. And I would assume, I don't know your answer, the answer to your question. I haven't looked at what the commentaries say, but my guess would be that writing a contract or writing a receipt, which is essentially writing a contract, would be even, would be even a, a greater burden. And today you just have a piece of paper. Even in my house, where I live in America 2020, 
My kids come and say, I need a color. I say, go downstairs, go to the printer. Yeah, we ran out of paper. Even in America, when you can get an Amazon delivery within 30 seconds, you can, you can run out of paper. If you're living in the field, in the, in, wherever you are in, in, in uh, Babylonia, living in the field and I have to pay you at the end of the day, I ran out of paper, what am I gonna do? You know. So these things happen. And the question is, if you say you have to have a receipt, what you're basically saying, that's the burden. And the question is, there's a cost to that burden and who pays the costs? So the Talmud would rather say, you know what? Let's, it may be an easier solution, not a perfect solution, but an easier solution that because we come from the premise that although usually we say, if you want to attract money, the burden of proof is upon you. This is an exception because you're an employee and we assume that you're an employee and you have a reputation to defend. And we assume that both you and the employer are uh, honest people. So we assume it's an honest mistake. So let's think about who would more, most likely make the honest mistake. Most likely the employer made the most on, honest mistake because he's got too much to worry about. And you have, you're, 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 you're laser focused. All you really, you're only here for the paycheck. So the only thing you're thinking about is when am I getting my paycheck? So it's less likely that you made the mistake. And therefore you, don't, you can extract, you can, you can get the money. But on the other hand, the employer, we want, to empl empl um, uh, we, want, we want to protect the employer. So we'll make the worker take an oath. But like I said, it's not a biblical oath. It's a rabbinic oath. It's not a severe. Um, and that is the best solution under these circumstances. In other words, if it, it, you can find a perfect solution, but, there, but every perfect solution has costs and imposing wit and uh, forcing the people to, to hire witness, to get witnesses and forcing people to write a contract and forcing people to write to, to pay in the, immediately to pay up front to avoid all possible scenario of dispute. So you could, yes, you could create a scenario where there's no dispute, but there's a cost and we don't want to overburden the, 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 the economy with that cost. So it seems that that's what's happening here. Rabbi, do the witnesses take an oath? No, very interesting. Witnesses in, in, in America, in America, and in, in, in every witness, anyone who walk, walks into court makes an oath. Um, which, by the way, is funny because that means that fifty percent of the people who are in court are lying under oath, right? At least fifty percent. So, so, so it, you'll see in the in the, Tal in the Talmud, Talmudic system, at least in the biblical law, actually rabbinic law also, we never make a situation where two people take in dispute take an oath against each other. We'll never do that because then there's for sure going to be a false a false oath, and it's a violation of the Ten Commandments. It's one of the worst sins. So what we'll do is we analyze which opinion we would we are more like more likely to believe, and then we oppose an oath on the other party. So the oath is is it's it's almost like part of the penalty. In other words, it's part of the tools we use to try to flesh out who's telling the truth. But if everyone takes an oath. There's no, there's no, um, um, there's no. Um, I mean, it loses, it loses its its potency. It loses its its effect. The bottom line is, witnesses do not take an oath ever. Now, so the plaintiff every, takes the oath, the witnesses they, don't they, take the oath. Yeah. They each, and we believe the plaintiff because he takes the oath, and because that's what. No, no, we believe the plaintiff in this case because we assume. We, you see what we did. We we started out and we said we assume we believe in the plaintiff anyway. We have two people here, we have the employer and the employee. So we're believing the plaintiff, which is the worker, the worker and the, and the employer. We believe the worker. Why do we believe the worker? We have a rational reason because we want to assume they're both saying the truth and we want to assume they're both honest and we want to assume someone made an honest mistake. It's more logical to think that the employer made an honest mistake. So we're going to believe the, we're going to believe the plaintiff who's the worker. However, the, the, we, we don't want the, 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 the employer to feel taken advantage of, so to pacify the work, the the the, the 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 to pacify the the employer, we say let the worker take an oath. But you pointed something. So this brings us to to an interesting point. Usually, the usually the defendant takes the oath. In this case, the plaintiff would take the oath to extract money, which is unusual. And that's why we say this is an exception to the rule because we're breaking all the rules because we're here we're putting and we're saying that the person um, extracting money can extract money without any evidence. So because we're sort of violating that premise, so we want to do something else to compensate the to compensate the the employer and therefore we impose the oath on the worker. But usually, so usually, so it's very interesting. Usually, the person who takes the oath is the person who let, who's less believed. In this case, we're the plaintiff, because usually the defendant takes the oath. Almost always the defendant takes the oath. In biblical, uh, almost always the defendant takes the oath. So usually the person who takes the oath is the person who's less believed. We give you an oath to help us believe you. In this case, 
the person who's taking the oath is the plaintiff, and there's only a few exceptions, rabbinic, all, all rabbinic, where the plaintiff will take, will take the oath. And it's not because we don't believe the plaintiff, because if we, would, we wouldn't, wouldn't believe him, we wouldn't be able to extract money. It's just to pacify the other side. The reason why you have to pacify the, the defendant is because we're going against the common, the, the, the premise, the common premise and the, and the logical premise that the burden of proof is upon the person who wants to extract. So because we're, we're violating, quote unquote, violating that rule, we have to do something else to, to pacify the defendant. But you're right. Usually the person who's making the oath is the person who we suspect as less believable. In this case, what the Talmud refers nishbayin v'naitlin. Usually the persons who, the, the people who take an oath and extract, that's the exception to the rule, but all those exceptions, the person who extracts will have to, will have to pay, uh, we'll have to take an oath. It's not because we don't believe them. It's because uh, we actually do believe them, but we're doing it to pacify the other party. So I hope I'm not, I hope I'm, I hope I'm somewhat clear. Thank you. Now, just to go back a second, because I'm afraid that, that Warren is going to ask this. Now, you may be asking uh -huh. something else, but just in case, I'm afraid you're going to ask this question, that in America, um, um, the, 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 the sort of severity of perjury is only if you lie in court. The, if the witnesses don't take an oath, then it's they didn't perjure themselves. But in the in the in the in the in the Jew in the Torah system, you perjure yourself the same with or without an oath. In other words, if the if the witness testifies falsely, even though he didn't take an oath, it's still the same ramifications. What are the ramifications? Is a separate discussion. So that's but that's for that. So I don't know if that's what you were thinking, but uh, okay, go ahead, Warren. I, I have a sort of a separate question, a, a different kind of question. But if, if I look at this system, I, I say to myself that the people who are devising it have in mind creating uh, rules that would encourage the employer, in, in this case, the employer and the employee, to resolve their dispute outside of court. In other words, create rules which, which would uh, look at a situation and ask, where do the incentives lie and how can we how can we uh, determine, how can we do this so that these guys will take care of their own problem, not bother us? And I could work out a scenario where, where putting my thumb on the scale in favor of the employee might lead to the employer, a system in which the employer says, I'm not gonna, here, you're paid, go away. <laughs> I'm not, don't come back. Right. And, and in a world where there may be not be so many employees in town, you could see how you could how these parties would work out an arrangement which may not actually be correct in the particular situation because one of them might be wrong, but it does rough justice and it avoids having to put the rabbinic court in the position of, of resolving these kinds of uh, he said or he said and he said disputes. Right. Now, that makes sense. I agree with you. I also agree that what you're saying about the pshara, about the compromise, that people would make the compromise on their own. I think that I think that I think that's true. But I would say it a little bit differently. I would say that if I'm the parties coming to court, let's assume let's assume both parties want to litigate. Okay, both parties want to litigate. It's very clear what the law would be in this case. It's not like you go into 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 uh, into. I'm uh, nothing again. I mean. I'm not going to attack the secular law right now, but I'm just saying you go, you walk into the into the court, you have, you know how you're going, and you have no idea how you're coming out, right? It, it, it you don't know, you don't know what can happen. Here, it seems like it's very simple because, uh, uh, um, it, like, like I said, when everybody knows what the game is and everyone knows it's clear what's it's clear what the, in other words, is much less the jury system. The jury system, who do you believe? Well, it depends which lawyer makes a better show. Okay. None of this happens in this in this system, at least not in this case. In this case, it's very clear. We start with the burden of proof, and if you don't have evidence, you're out. There are a few exceptions. Employees are one of them because, as you say, we want it, we want to make sure we, don't, we we have to balance the interest of labor and of of of, of management because otherwise the, the economy breaks down and everybody suffers. But I think that the clarity helps people um, um, if they want to compromise, they can compromise on their own because you know, and also we know what the compromise will look like um, once, because you, you know, you know, you're know you comfortable compromising because you know what, what you're gonna get in court. And then you know, okay, how much is, does it cost me to even go to court, right? I think the clarity helps people. Ironically, I think the more clear the law is, the more people would compromise. I think you can make that argument. But it's interesting that it's clear what you're mentioning that we want it, the rabbis are clearly trying to balance and figure out 
who benefits. I, I just think it's an interesting, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, process. I'm not saying that they, that they, that they, uh, they basically end up with a simple resolution. Everybody needs everybody. But I think that the process asking, looking at this relationship of employer employee and saying who benefits and saying ultimately uh, they both benefit, I think is very interesting because we like to think of it as very adversarial. And it's and it's and it's uh, one or the other, and one is taking advantage of the other. That's that's the way we think about it. And I think to some degree that could be true. In other words, it doesn't. They're not saying they're exactly the same. Maybe one has an upper hand. Maybe one doesn't. But ultimately, ultimately, the Talmud is basically the conclusion is you cannot say you cannot squarely say that one person is benefiting and the other, one party. In other words, the employer versus employee. One is benefiting and the other one is not, or one is forced and the other one is not forced. They're both forced to marry each other, right? They're, they're, they're both stuck, basically. They're basically, they're in a tango. They both need each other. And I think that's that's also an interesting how they're processing it, uh, what is it, 1,500 years ago or more. Okay, so let's read it in Maimonides. And then, oh, we, Okay, give me just one second. I want to see if I could say it inside the Talmud, and then it'll be more fun. Go ahead. Go ahead. I I just wanted to uh, to mention from from experience, there is there is. Uh, I mean, it seems like it's helping the power imbalance where the employer has uh, sometimes you know you're dependent on your employer, and uh, you know this helps uh, the employee to to uh, have an easier time making their case. Uh, that same right. power imbalance can courage even though they know they have less of a burden of proof you know they're you know more likely to be believed because they're more likely to remember uh, stepping forward is, is a barrier yes so yes you're, you're, so still you're saying you, you're yeah so eugene i think what you're saying is that you're saying that ultimately at the end of the day we we think that the employ employer is the more powerful one in this relationship and when you're giving a certain right, when you're giving a certain advantage in the negotiation to the employee, to the worker, you end up not really, ultimately on the books you're favoring them, but in reality, I think what you're saying is you're basically leveling the playing field because there is a, a price of coming out and confronting your employer because tomorrow you have to get hired again. So, so you're saying that don't look at it so simply as we're just sort of benefiting the, 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 the employee we are the worker. We are, but at the end, at the end, we're, we're leveling it because there's a built-in imbalance, which I would I would agree. That's my perspective as well. But um, I think that that but but what's interesting that what would what would challenge that is the Talmud is, sort of seems to resist the notion that one needs the other and the other doesn't need the other. In other words, you live we, we live in a global economy. Okay, so you want to hire someone to be to 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 do your taxes. You can you can you can go anywhere. Right, in a, in, a, in a click of a button, you can you can produce stuff in China. You can have a, a guy in India doing your taxes. If you're living in a little shtetl and everybody, you could, if you're a bad employer, nobody's going to work for you, and 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 uh, you you're in trouble because you have you have uh, you have a produce that's going to rot, and if it rots, your investment is down the drain. So I agree with you that in today's economy, it would be much have it would it would much it would have a benefit of of leveling the playing field. Uh, going back, it seems that the Talmud would resist that 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 statement that the employer definitely has the upper hand. I, I think it probably depends on what exactly is going on and, the, and, and, the, and the, even the, the, the every town, what is the labor market like? What is the, what do they call it? What is the um, age of the population, right? All these things would, 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 would affect, but I think that you're right. I think that when you look at the story at, at the Talmud and you wanna look at how do we extract meaning from this to today, I think that in today's, in today's reality, it doesn't really, apply today because today is much, like I said, the whole question will fall apart because it's much easier to track payment. But the notion of you're mentioning that we're, we, when you're helping the, the worker, you may actually be leveling instead of giving him the upper hand. I, I see that, I see that. And, and they, they would uh, think twice before coming forward because yeah, it's still a consensual relationship. It's still a yes, it is a risk. But, but uh, you know, to get that, Job, there is a cost involved also to get the other 
times. And you will think twice when you keep imploring to sign that relationship unless you really believe. Yes. Oh. So you're saying the other. You're saying another point. You're saying another reason to believe the employer, employee, the worker is if you are finally stepping forward, there's a good chance that you have a, re a reason to, and you're not doing it just because you you say, oh, maybe I'll get paid double. It may not pay for you to do that in the long run. So the fact that you're willing to step up, if you're in an imbalanced relationship and you're willing to speak up, um, that that actually itself may be uh, proof of your of, of that you're saying the truth. So that's a good that's a good that's good Talmudic logic. Talmud doesn't offer that logic, but that's that's valid Talmudic logic. Okay, we have we have. Uh, Let's do five more minutes, if they have permission. And I don't know if we'll do it inside the Talmud. We'll just do it. We'll just do it in the Talmud. We'll do it in the Talmud. I don't know if we'll do it in Maimonides. Just a just a programming uh, um, announcement. We're going to take a break from Maimonides for six weeks because next week, Tuesdays, we start the JLI. We do the JLI both in the morning and in the evening. A meditation and Jewish meditation from Sinai, Jewish meditation. So, if you really want the law, you'll have to wait six weeks, <laughs> or you can find another Zoom. Uh, there's plenty of Torah online. But uh, if you want to get to this specific uh, group, we're gonna we're gonna take a six week break where we shift to more more, more meditation, and then we'll be able to come back uh, back to the law with a heightened uh, sense of spirituality. We'll be able to solve our financial legal problems and disputes with the more of a sense of being connected to our soul. So that may be a good thing. Okay, I want to say like this: It seems like right now we're putting all the benefit on the we're putting we're, we're helping the employ employee the worker. But now the Talmud is going to say, if you believe the worker, why don't you believe the worker all the way? And here's a fascinating place where we don't, where we give, actually give the upper hand to the employer. What is the case? The case is if the dispute is not whether I have been paid, I'm the worker. The dispute is not whether I have been paid, but I come the end of the day and you tell, and you pay me, you pay me uh, $8 an hour. And I said, what are you talking about? You promised me $10 an hour. So now we have a dispute of how much I'm supposed to be paid. Now, by the same logic, believe the worker. Thomas says, no, 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 no. When it comes to how much you're going to be paid, we believe the employer. In other words, unless I, unless I could bring proof, if I bring proof, then I can get paid what, what, what I think I deserve. But again, assuming there's no proof. So usually, then we go back to the standard case. No proof, standard case. Standard case, the, the burden of proof is upon the one extracting. Here it's the, here it's the, employ, the worker extracting. And therefore, if, I'm, if, if, if I say that you promised me more, you promised me $200 for the day. And the other guy says, I only promised you $100 for the day. Um, we believe, we don't, we, don't, we don't believe the employer, the, the worker in this case. And that's the Talmud's next question. If so, if you have this idea that the employer is so busy with running his business. So he's more likely to forget, whereas the worker is very uh, focused on the payment and therefore he's more likely to remember. So why don't you believe the worker when it comes to the question of how much was promised? That's the next step. So we have two more steps left to this piece, but we'll see, we'll see how far we go. If so, even that, that then even with regard to the amount fixed as a payment, the employer is apt to be forgetful. Why then is it taught in the Baraita if the craftsman says you fixed two coins as my payment and the other, the employer says I fixed only one coin as your payment. The halacha is that the burden of proof rests upon the claimant. In other words, the, 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 uh, the, the plaintiff, in other words, the worker, the burden of proof is upon the worker. And if he has no proof, you don't believe the worker, you believe the, the employer in this case. So we'll skip this. Um, and, uh, so the Gemara says, the Gemara doesn't explain, but it's, uh, the Gemara assumes it's obvious. So I'll, I'll ask you to explain this to me. The Gemara answers, with regard to the fixing of wages, he certainly remembers. You're an employer. You did your calculation. You know how much profit you need. You calculating your costs. You're an employer. You know how much you promised and how much you didn't. You didn't forget that. That's important. That's an important factor. A, a technical question, did I pay you or did I paid everybody else and not you? I have 30 employees. Okay, you can forget. But how much you pay your employers, how much you pay your workers, if you're if you're a business owner, you know how much you're paying. You know how much you agreed to. That's the assumption. So it's interesting. When it comes to who do we believe in this relationship, it depends. Whether or not you were paid, we believe the worker. How much you promised to, to pay, we believe that we believe the we believe the employer. Again, unless I have evidence, unless I have proof otherwise. But if there's no other proof, that's the standard. And now there's one more caveat. Like I said, I alluded to it earlier, that when do we believe the worker when he says he wasn't paid? Only when the payment is due. 
I come back two weeks later, we, he, he, we, we, don't, that, we don't believe that. We don't believe you would go, we don't believe you would be quiet for so long. So then it goes back to the standard law that if you claim you weren't paid and it's two weeks after the payment was due, burden of proof is upon you. If you can't prove it, too bad. So let's see the next piece. And that will be the conclusion for today. I don't want to keep you here all day long. The Gemara asks, if so, oh, we're never going to end. Okay, it goes back and forth. Let's stop here. Let's stop here. We'll come back in six weeks. It just goes back and forth. There's a, there's a, there's a volleyball back and forth. So we, we have to stop here. But the bottom line is we could understand that ultimately, okay, well, let's leave it here. I, I'm, let's leave it here for now. Okay, so this is a story in short. Thank you so much for joining. Um, comments, questions are welcome. We, like I said, the next time we do the Talmud and Maimonides will be in, uh, we'll take a six week break. Everybody's welcome to join the meditation from Sinai. Uh, ChabadGreenish.org forward slash JLI for more information. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Rama. Thank you.